the movement, thank you for the privilege of serving as your vice president. It was the greatest honor of my life. You know, I'll always be grateful for what President Donald Trump did for this country. And it was a privilege to serve at his side. The president and I have had our differences, and we have them still. But elections are about the future. And I believe different times call for different leadership. Now, we gather at a difficult time in the life of our nation. As I said at the start, I'll say at the close. American people are frustrated and anxious. So much has been lost in such a short time. But despair is not in our nature. Surrender is not in our vocabulary. I love this country. I've dedicated my life to serving it. So I, I want to challenge you before I leave. I want to encourage you to remember who we are. And remember whose hand has ever been on this nation from its very founding. And a careful study of American history shows that every time the American people were asked to do hard things, the American people have always risen to the challenge. We've righted historic wrongs. We've striven for a more perfect union. We've been a beacon of hope, of freedom for the world. We crossed the frozen Delaware River. We wrote a constitution that changed the history of the world. We held the hills of Gettysburg. We stormed the sands of Normandy and raised a flag on Iwo Jima and drove tanks through the gates of Dachau. We marched on Washington and won women the right to vote and marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and advanced the cause of equality and freedom for every American. We built rockets that flew to the moon, leaving Russians in our exhaust. We built the largest economy and the greatest military in the history of the world. We rushed into the burning towers, drove across the country to search for survivors in the rubble. We're Americans. There's nothing we can't accomplish. Americans' story is not one of despair, it is one of hope. The truth is the challenges we face today do not demand the valor that has been called upon in Americans in years past, but fulfilling our role in this moment in the life of the nation requires that we summon our best, that we find the grace to see the best in one another, and that we face the future with courage. Never forget where we've been. Never forget how far we've come or who we are. The American people are the most freedom-loving, faith-filled, idealistic, innovative, and generous people the world has ever known. The American people have always been great. We just need government as good as our people. And I believe we'll have it again soon, and I just ask for your prayers. I'd be grateful for your prayers for my family as we embark on this new journey to serve our nation. But I also ask for your prayers for all of the American people. We don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. And I believe with all my heart that God is not done with America yet. Enshrined on the Liberty Bell are the words from Leviticus, proclaim liberty throughout all the land and unto all the inhabitants thereof. And I say to all the good men and women gathered here at this Road to Majority Conference, I believe if we proclaim liberty, if we hold the banner of freedom high, if we rally alongside men and women who will stand without apology for our best ideals and our values, and if we turn back to the author and finisher of our faith and freedom, freedom story, the American story, has only just be gone. So let's get to work. Let's make it happen. I know the best days for the greatest nation on earth, with your help and God's help, are yet to come. Thank you very much. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen,
please welcome from the state of Missouri, Senator Josh Hawley. How you doing? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Boy, it is good to be here. I tell you what, it is always good to be with some patriotic, Bible-believing, God-fearing Americans. Or as Joe Biden calls you, threats to our democracy. <laughs> hey, I tell you what, let me just get my confessions in right up front here. I'm proud to be here as a conservative, but much more important than that. I am proud to be here as a follower of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. And I just say this, to our friends on the left who are constantly telling us that faith and politics have to be separated, that we as Christians are supposed to keep our beliefs and our faith and our expression inside the church walls, I just say no way, no how, not in the United States of America. There is not. There is not one square inch of all creation over which Jesus Christ is not Lord. And there is not one square inch of this country or the problems we face that the Bible does not have something to say about. And it is time for Christians to be bold again and to take the lead again. Listen, you know, you know in every hour of this country's danger, in every moment of trying, Christians have risen to help lead this country and to help lead the way. We did it in the first great awakening that helped move this country toward revolution and independence. We did it in the abolitionist movement that fought for decades to eliminate the scourge of slavery. And you know, in this month when we have a federal holiday where we recognize the abolition of slavery in this country, can I just tell a truth here again that the left finds hard to believe? Here it is. Christianity is the faith and America is the place that slavery came to die. And we should be proud of that. Christians were the ones. It was Christians who led the evangelical reform movement in the last century that protected the family by ending child labor in this country, by limiting the working hours for men in the factories to protect them so they could come home to their families, so they get the Sabbath day off and be able to worship the Lord. No, at every moment, at every time, Christians have risen to lead, and now it's time again because we are facing the greatest challenge this country has ever seen, certainly in my lifetime. You know, President Reagan told a group of evangelicals 40 years ago this year that the focus of evil in his day was Soviet Marxism. Well, now we face a new Marxism, a new Marxism that is rising in this country, a cultural Marxism that has infected our universities. It has taken over much of the media, the entertainment industry, and it now totally controls the Democrat Party. A new Marxism that wants to see our history completely disparaged, that tells us America is systemically racist, systemically bigoted, that the soul of America is somehow warped. This is a Marxism that says that there's no such thing as male and female, that there's not two genders, there's 2,000 genders, and it tells our children that the way God made them is wrong. Yeah, this is a new Marxism that is the greatest challenge that we thread, that we face, and it has infected even our corporations. And I'll just tell you this, you know, the left, they're always saying separation of church and state, separation of church and state, but here's the deal. These new Marxists want to give America a new religion. They want to impose on us the religion of woke. It is the religion of transgenderism, critical race theory, and open borders multiculturalism and they are shoving it down our throats. The leftist elites have proclaimed themselves as the priests of this new religion. They're the high priests. Here's the problem. The country doesn't agree with them. They're wrong, we're right. It's easy. And the question of our time is, who's gonna lead this country? Who's gonna run this country? Is it going to be we the people? Or is it going to be the new priests of wokery? That's the question we face. And now in this time of challenge and trial, we need Christians to rise to lead. And just think of the, the onslaught, the onslaught 
of these new, of these new Marxists, of these new priests of woke. Look what they're doing at Target, trying to force on us and on our children this gender ideology, this transgender ideology. Look what they're doing at Bud Light, you know, a company that tells every red-blooded, blue-collar working man in this country that he needs to be re-educated. I mean, really, look what Big Pharma is doing. Big Pharma, let's tell the truth, Big Pharma is making millions, if not billions of dollars on chemical abortion drugs that kill our children in the womb. They're profiting off of it big time. Those same companies are making money hand over fist doing what? Making drugs that sterilize our children, telling them that they shouldn't be the gender that God made them to be. Now, I tell you what, all across this country, we see these corporations pushing relentlessly this Marxist agenda, pushing relentlessly this religion of woke. And you know, some Republicans I've heard recently, some Republicans have said, oh, but I don't like culture wars. I don't want to have to engage in a culture war. And they also say, oh, but don't criticize corporate America. We mustn't do that. I just say to those people, listen, we may not have started this culture war, but we're going to win it. We are going to win it. And as for corporate America and criticizing them, let's get one thing straight. Corporations are not people. And there is no reason why corporate America should control this country. I've got news for these corporations, these woke corporations. We are not going to surrender this nation to the cultural Marxists in the C-suite. No way, no how. These are the people, let's not forget, these are the people sitting in the C-suite who have for decades now shipped our jobs overseas. They are happy to sell out American workers to go make a quick buck in China. These are the people who are happy to pay slave wages in China and other nations and they won't pay American workers a fair wage. They take our jobs away, they decimate our communities, and then they lecture us about social justice. These are the people who are out there pushing this woke ideology, forcing it down our throats at every turn, and now they want to make us, they want to reduce us to mere consumers. Their message to us, all of them, the Targets and the Bud Lights and the Coca-Colas, their message to us is just shut up and buy the stuff that we tell you to buy. Well, I tell you what, here's my response. As the Apostle Paul said, I will not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So no thank you. This country belongs to us, not to the corporations. And I don't know about you, but it's time to get those corporations, the woke corporations, out of politics. Enough. Enough. Get them out. And their money. Get it out of politics. Why should those corporations, why should the C-suite and all of these woke executives, why should they and their money count more than your vote? Why should they be able to control this country rather than we the people? Why should they be the ones who set the agenda while well, they try to debase our culture and serve their God that is money. No, thank you. No, we need to stand up again for the right of the people to run this country, for the right of the people to be in charge. And Christians, Christians have to lead this movement. You know, Christians, we believe. Why do we have, why did the United States of America embrace the liberty of the individual? You and I know why. It's because Jesus Christ went to a cross to pay for the sins of every individual. It's because we know the dignity of every individual because we believe in a God who created every individual with worth. That's why we fight for the lives of the innocent unborn. That's why we fight for those who are not heard. And that's why we believe in democracy because we the people have the right to rule, because we the people have rights given to us, not by government, not by corporations, not by the liberal elite, but given to us by God. And we will not surrender those rights. We will reclaim them for our day. That's the task in front of us. That's the task in front of us. And so now we need Christians again to rise up and take the lead. Listen, let me just be really clear on this for those in Washington who don't get it. Let me say it really plainly. There is no future for the conservative movement without Christians. 
And I just say to all of those DC consultants who just can't stand to talk about evangelicals and who cringe every time you mention the right to life and who hate all of this talk about defending our culture, there is no future for the Republican Party without Christians. Get it into your heads. It was Christians who stood up to put Ronald Reagan in the White House in 1980, yes. It was Christians who put Donald Trump in the White House, and it is Christians who will lead this movement forward. And the reason for that is, the, the reason for that is simple. It's because the Christian faith is what has formed the soul of this nation. You know, Abraham Lincoln called it our ancient faith. It was the faith that united this country, the faith that you see written into the Declaration of Independence, that we have our rights, inalienable, can't be taken away from us, inalienable by a creator God. That is what has united this country. It is what has shaped the soul of this country. It remains the hope and inspiration of the working men and women of this country even now. And so as the left attacks our faith, as they attack the Bible, as they attack the influence of Christianity in our nation, we know that the time is now for Christians to rise, to defend and recover the ancient faith that has made us who we are. And as we do that, we will protect the future, we will protect this nation, and we will lead the conservative movement to a new day. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you so much. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Director of the Georgia Faith and Freedom Coalition, Mac Parnell. Good morning, Faith and Freedom! Are y'all fired up? Well, we're just getting started, all right. I know we got a strong group from North Carolina here, and I'm proud of that. But let me hear from my Georgia folks. Where are my Georgia folks? I think we might be giving Jason a run for his money this year. So, uh, so proud of all my folks from Georgia for coming out. But it is a true pleasure to introduce our next speaker. He's an American business leader. He's an unapologetic champion for truth. He's a graduate of Harvard and Yale, and he's not afraid to stand for our conservative values. But I would argue he's had success in the business field, a best-selling author, but I would argue his biggest political or business success is the fact that Don Lemon is no longer on CNN because of this man, presidential candidate, Vivek Ramaswamy. Thank you, it's good to see you all. Good to see you, it's good to be back. I've seen many of you in Iowa. It's good to be here in DC. I'm gonna kick this off by taking you back to a moment in 1993, when I was in second grade in Southwest Ohio. And I heard Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech for the first time. That was the speech where he said, I hope my four children grow up in a country where they are judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. I'll tell you something. That dream stuck with me. It meant something to me because it was the dream that allowed me to go in a single generation from being the kid of Indian immigrants who came to this country with almost no money to becoming the founder of a multi-billion dollar company that I led as CEO. We developed some medicines. One is a life-saving therapy in kids. Another one is an approved drug for prostate cancer. But I stepped down from my job as a CEO to focus on a different kind of cancer. Not a biological cancer, but a cultural cancer that threatened to kill that dream that Martin Luther King had 60 years ago. 
a cancer that threatened to kill the dream that allowed me to achieve everything I have in my life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm speaking to you this morning as a member of my generation. I'm the first millennial ever to run for U.S. president as a Republican. I appreciate that. (laughs) And I'll tell you something about us. I think it's true of all of us. It's definitely true of us millennials. We are hungry for a cause. We are hungry for purpose and meaning and identity at a time in our national history when the things that used to fill that hunger, faith, patriotism, hard work, family, these things have disappeared. And that leaves a moral vacuum in its wake. And when you have a black hole that runs that deep, That is when the poison fills the void. Wokeism, transgenderism, climatism, COVIDism, globalism, depression, anxiety, drug usage, suicide. It almost doesn't matter what the poison is. These are symptoms of a deeper void. Symptoms of a vacuum of purpose and meaning in our country. And our job in the conservative movement today is to rise up, to level up, to say that we're done playing whack-a-mole. We're not just running from something. We are running to something, to our vision of what it actually means to be an American today. We're lost in the desert. We are today. I joke around. We're like a bunch of blind bats, actually. Flying around in some dark cave trying to figure out where we are. You don't know how a bat figures out where it is? It doesn't have eyes. <laughs> Can't see. It sends sonar signals. It bounces off the wall. It comes back and says, this is where I am. We do the same thing. I send out a signal. It bounces off something that is true, something that is fixed. My family, the mother and father who brought me into this world, the children who I brought into this world, that is true. That is real. That bounces back. That tells me this is where I am. Send out a signal. It bounces off of my faith in God. That faith is real. It is true. That bounces back. It tells me this is where I am. Send out a signal. It bounces off my belief in this country that I am a citizen of the United States of America, not some nebulous global citizen somewhere. That is true. That is real. That bounces back. It tells me this is where I am. I work hard. I create something in the world. That is true. That is real. That bounces back and tells me, this is where I am. What happens when those things disappear? We send out these signals, and then nothing comes back. That's where we are today. We are lost in that wilderness. It is when the Israelites escape from the Pharaoh that they're lost in the desert. What do they say? They say, we want to go back and bend the knee to the Pharaoh. You have a hole the size of God in your heart. If God does not fill it, something else will instead. The same can be said of belief in a nation. This is our moment as a movement to rise up to the occasion and say, this is what we actually stand for. This is what it means to be an American. To me, what does it mean to be an American? It means we believe in the ideals that set this nation into motion 250 years ago. Ideals like meritocracy and the pursuit of excellence that you do get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. That is why I expect the Supreme Court in the coming days to end affirmative action in college admissions. And as the next president, I will end it in every sphere of our lives. That is what it means to be an American. What does it mean to be an American? It means we believe in the rule of law. That if you're like my parents, you know what? You do get to come to this country legally through the front door if you want to follow the rules and pay your taxes and live according to our values. But it also means that your first act of entering this country cannot break the law. And that is why I will use our own military to secure our own southern border. That is what it means to be an American. Nations have borders. It means we believe in this radical idea that our founding fathers had, 
a radical dream that I have as a citizen, that the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government, not this bureaucracy that actually runs the show today. This is what it means to be a citizen of this country that we won the American Revolution to spawn. Above all, America as a country, we are founded on the pursuit of the truth itself. Why do we have free speech? The path to truth runs through free speech. America is a nation founded on the truth, and we should not be apologetic to stand up and speak for the truth. So let's do that today. Let's talk truth. Let's say what's true without fear. God is real. Unborn life is life. There are two genders. Fossil fuels are a requirement for human prosperity. Reverse racism is racism. An open border is not a border. Parents determine the education of their children. The nuclear family is the best known form of governance to mankind. Capitalism is the best system known to lift people up from poverty. We have three branches of government in this country, not four, and the U.S. Constitution is the strongest guarantor of freedoms in human history. That is the truth. We will not back down from the truth. We will stand up for the truth. We will fight for the truth. That is what won us the American Revolution 250 years ago. That is what will win us the revolution of 2024. We have celebrated our diversity and our differences so much that we forgot all of the ways we are really just the same as Americans, bound by that common set of ideals, bound by the truth. That is what this nation was founded on. Our diversity can be a beautiful thing, but it is meaningless if there's nothing greater that unites us across that diversity. Without that, think about it with me. We're really just a different looking group of two-legged higher mammals with a bunch of different shades of melanin <laughs> walking some geographic space we call a country doing what our iPhones told us to do on a given day. That's not America. It's the America I see sometimes, but that is not the America we know. The America we know is a vision of what that place can be. E pluribus unum means from many, one. That's the dream that won the American Revolution. That is the dream that reunited us after the Civil War. That is the dream that won us two world wars and the Cold War. That is the dream that still gives hope to the free world. And if we can revive that dream over group identity and victimhood and grievance, then nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus is going to defeat us. That's what American exceptionalism is all about. And that is what we together will revive to save this great nation. And I will tell you this in closing this up. Tonight, we see the real problems in our country. They are real. We have an administrative state that runs the government instead of the real government. I'm going to fix that. We're dependent on our enemy for our modern way of life in a way that was never true in American history. We depend on the CCP. We can rise up to the occasion and fix that. We have a generation of Americans, Gen Z, less than 15% of whom say they're proud to be an American. 25% recruitment deficit in the U.S. military. 60% of whom say they would sooner give up their right to vote than to give up their access to TikTok. We are in a national identity crisis, but I promise you this as we leave tonight, leave this afternoon and this morning when you go back home, wherever you go, remember this. 
We don't have to be a nation in decline. We do not have to be Rome. We do not have to be Carthage. As a nation, I truly believe it. And take it from me as a young person. I'm 37 years old. I was born in 1985. I truly hope and pray and believe that my best days may still be ahead of me. I think the same is true of our country. I believe it is true that our best days as a country can still be ahead of us. We don't have to be a nation in decline. We are just a little young going through our own version of adolescence, figuring out who we are going to be when we grow up. And when you see it that way, it starts to make sense again. When you go through adolescence, you go through that identity crisis. You doubt yourself. You doubt who you are. You forget what you're made of. But we are stronger on the other side of it when we get to our adulthood. As it is for us as individuals, let it be for us as a nation. I don't think we're a nation in decline. I still believe in my bones that we are a nation in our ascent, in the early stages of our ascent, on our way. We, not, we might not even be at base camp in our way to that mountaintop. I believe we can get there. It's not going to happen automatically. It's going to require each of us to do our part to be able to tell our kids, for me to be able to tell my two sons and look them in the eye and mean it when I say that we are still the nation where no matter who you are or where your parents came from or what your skin color is, that you still get ahead in America based on your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication. That is the American dream. That is what we are running to. That is what it means to be an American. And that is what we will revive to save this great nation. Thank you all. God bless you. God bless your families. And God bless our United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. First is position, okay, second differentiation, third benefit, and then brand. Position is nothing more than a hole, H-O-L-E, hole in the marketplace. That's something that you decide privately to do, uh, and then you differentiate your hole in the marketplace publicly. And let's just say, to help you understand it, let's say that collectively we are Rupert Murdoch 25 years ago, and we want to start a cable television network. Well, we don't sit there and analyze CBS, ABC, CNN. In essence, Rupert said, I don't care what they do, you know, because if America is a 50-50 country, half Republican, half Democrat, half conservative, half liberal, half of the country doesn't have a television network that they can watch the news on and, and look for the information they're looking for. So he occupied a hole in the marketplace. And he differentiated himself from CNN and ABC, CBS, etc with uh, Bill O'Reilly, Megyn Kelly, Sean Hannity, Glenn Beck, Fox and Friends. So he publicly differentiated himself from uh, everybody else out there. And then benefit is obvious. You got news and information uh, that you don't get anywhere else uh, on television. Fourth is brand. Brand is the ball game. Products are not uh, sold anymore, they're bought. Once a week, I go into a supermarket. I'm a big fan of, of Wegmans. 40, 50,000 items for sale in that store. Not one salesperson in that store, not one. There are people who take my money when I've made my decision. There's no one saying, uh, no, Mr. Vigory, uh, this week, rather than buy uh, Viva paper towels, won't you try you know, one of these other brands here? Uh, thank you very much. I'm sure they're very good. You know, I'm a Viva man. I'm a brand person, okay? That's the ball game. Very simply, think of brand as uh, what makes you singular, what makes you unique, what makes you uh, Seth Godin's 
purple cow. Position, differentiation, benefit, and, and brand. People think uh, everybody knows my brand. No, they don't. Delta does not have a brand. American Airlines does not have a brand. They're famous names. Does it matter to you whether you fly Delta or American? You know, not at all. You know, Southwest Airlines has got a brand. When people uh, hear your brand, is it something unique? Do they really know how you are different from anybody else out there? You get these four things right, and life is going to be downhill, and you're going to have a big success. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome former WWE superstar and the mayor of Knox County, Tennessee, Glenn Jacobs. Thanks, guys. It is a great time to be alive, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, there is no time that I would rather be alive than right now. Now, I know what y'all are saying. Great time. What's this dude talking about? His cheese has done slid off his cracker. <laughs> He's a wrestler guy, right? It must be true. He's got hit in the head too many times. How could this be great times? These are hard times. Look at everything going on. The same people who spent two years telling us to follow the science now ignore basic biology. The media no longer reports the news. They massage the facts to promote their preferred narrative. And if you don't agree with that narrative, you're a bigot or even worse, an extremist. Big tech colludes with the government to censor dissenting voices. Inflation is still high. The economy feels like it's a house of cards. There's a disaster at our southern border. Our schools have become indoctrination centers. The president of the United States doesn't seem to know where he is most of the time. You all see the recent press conference that he had where he ended up by saying, God save the queen, man. And his staff said, we don't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know what he's talking about either. And perhaps most alarming of all, the alphabet soup agencies of the federal government have been weaponized for political purposes. And the first time ever a former president of the United States has been indicted using what I will call very generous, generously, a novel application of the law. These are hard times. And of that, there is no doubt. I didn't say that we were living in good times. I said it was a great time to be alive. And it's a great time to be alive because the end of one cycle is approaching and a new cycle will soon begin. Everything in nature runs in cycles. Day turns to night, night turns back to day. Spring yields to summer, summer turns to fall, fall turns to winter, then back to spring. Then, excuse me, back to spring. In Ecclesiastes 3.1, the Bible talks about these cycles. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. See, God designed nature as cyclical, not linear. And history is the same way. Karl Marx believed that history was a steady march towards the ultimate social arrangement, communism. Fortunately, like with most of what Marx thought, he was wrong. When you look back at history, you see predictable patterns emerge. As Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So here we are, as we have been many times in our history, our nation faces an existential threat to our way of life. This time, it's not from out there, but it comes from within. Cultural Marxism is not some conspiracy theory, as the left would have you believe. It began with the Frankfurt School in Germany in the early 20th century when Marxist academics decided that there was never going to be a worldwide workers' revolution because, ironically, Capitalism produces too much wealth for too many people. So they had turned their attention to undermining Western culture and to a revolution driven not by workers, but by society's elites. 
Make no mistake, what we are witnessing today is a counter-revolution to the principles of 1776. Just like 1776, trouble has come to America. Now we can feel sorry for ourselves that we live in such a time, or we can rejoice that we have the opportunity to shape the world that our children and our grandchildren will live in. In the American crisis, thank you, yes, thank you, that's a good line, I appreciate it, thank you. In the American crisis, a pamphlet that George Washington found so inspirational that he ordered it read to the troops at Valley Forge. Thomas Paine wrote, if there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. And the single reflection, well applied, is sufficient to awaken every man to duty. Duty is calling again. Now is not the time to shirk it. We must embrace it. Obviously, it's easier said than done. It's tempting to throw up our hands in despair, to lose hope. I mean, good Lord, they just indicted a president. What chance did the rest of us stand? The challenges are too big. But folks, we serve a big God. And as people of faith, there is no challenge too big. A while back, I was listening to a podcast about this very subject. The host said something that I will never forget. He said, when your faith begins with a boulder rolling away from the mouth of a tomb, and a man who three days before had been beaten and tortured within an inch of his life and then nailed to a cross to die, and that man comes walking out of that tomb like a boss, like it never even happened. The words fear and hopelessness are not, cannot be in your vocabulary. Nowadays, fear, hopelessness, and anger abound. And I get it, these are hard times. But as conservatives, we must set an example Moreover, as Christians, we must set an example. We must remain positive and committed to what we believe in, not engage in negativity and concentrate solely on what we oppose. They just started the Faith and Freedom chapter in Tennessee, and what's impressed me the most is the positive message that it promotes. The first event that I was invited to was to recognize state lawmakers who champion freedom. And if, if you've been following Tennessee politics, this last session, was the most contentious, the worst session since the Civil War. Those folks needed a pat on the back, someone telling them job well done. But there are a lot of groups out there right now who do nothing but criticize and complain. Instead of following Ronald Reagan's adage, that the person who agrees with you 80% of the time is your friend and ally, not a 20% traitor. They're more critical of those on their side than they are the opposition. And I can tell you as an elected official, that gets really old really quick. You tend to not listen to those people anymore. They lose influence with you. On the other hand, when you treat someone like you're on their side, they listen to you. Doesn't mean that you're always going to agree and that you shouldn't hold them to a high bar, hold them accountable, and call them when they make a mistake. But if you approach things from a place of mutual respect and friendship, you're gonna go a lot further than if you come from a perspective of constant confrontation. So much negativity right now. If we wanna set ourselves apart, be positive, be constructive, and above all, have faith and hope. Yeah, these are hard times, but change is coming. It's up to us to determine whether that change is positive or negative. I believe it's gonna be positive. See, the other side, right now, they're thinking, we're on the ascent. We're about to take everything over. Aaron, for a rude awakening. That's right. Because nighttime, nighttime is coming for them, but for the rest of us, dawn is breaking. Remember when Ronald Reagan said, it's morning in America? Ladies and gentlemen, 
it is once again about to be morning in America. And I do believe that our best days are ahead of us. Thank you all for the great work that you're doing. Thank you for having me here today. God bless all of you. And God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you. This is a defining moment in the movement. If you buy the idea that it is a state issue only, then it never really was about the child. Right. This is a moment of reflection. You can be a minority voice in California, but you can still be heard. The nominee of the Republican Party must, must be for the child not about geography. I'm here to tell my fellow Republicans, you should want to talk about abortion, not be afraid of it. And if you're running to be the standard bearer of the Republican Party, it should be easy for you to say the following. If you send me a bill outlawing abortion at 15 weeks where the baby can feel pain to operate on the child, you provide anesthesia because we know they feel pain, I will sign it. If that is hard, you're in the wrong business. How do we live in a world where the, we're taking a position that 70% of the people like and we're afraid to talk about it? That's nuts. The pro-life movement has always been about what? The child. So when you hear somebody say our Constitution requires us to sit on the sidelines and be like China and North Korea, you're wrong. Demand of those who want to lead a great party to be bold. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from South Carolina, Senator Lindsey Graham. Thank you. Thank you all very much. You're all hopped up on Mountain Dew after all these speakers, right? All right, so I'm not come here to, to sell more Mountain Dew. I'm here to warn you, uh, encourage you to continue the fight for the unborn at every state and in Washington, D.C., right? Yes, Call to action. As I speak, Democrats on Wednesday tried to introduce legislation called the Women Healthcare Protection Act to create a national standard. Have you been following this? Their bill would overturn every state's pro-life protection. They would set as a national standard abortion on demand up to the moment of birth using taxpayer dollars. The next time we have this vote, will you come to Washington and get lend your voice to encourage us to say no? Will you? So everything we fought for for 50 years is at risk. The Democratic Party, if they get the opportunity, will change the rules of the Senate, requiring only a simple majority to pass bills. What's the first bill they're going to pass? The China abortion bill. It's not the Women Health Care Protection Act. It doesn't codify Roe. It allows abortion up to the man on demand up to the moment of birth using your taxpayer dollars like China and North Korea. This is the China abortion bill. America, wake up. Wake up. I will do everything in my power to prevent this. They will change the rules of the Senate. They will wipe out every pro-life law in the country by a single bill. They will make Puerto Rico and uh, D.C. a state, making it harder to get legislation passed in the future. They will take the Supreme Court and go from 9 to 13 to dilute the majority we've worked for for 50 years. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, we should be happy a year later that finally, after 50 years, we got Roe v. Wade off the books. But I'm telling you right now, the war 
the fight is not over. Schumer promised to fight endlessly. What is he fighting for? To have a national law to make us China on abortion, to wipe out everything you've worked for all these years at the state level. We're not going to let that happen. To those who believe there's no role for the unborn in Washington, you are wrong. Our Constitution does not require me, a United States Senator, to sit on the sidelines and not be able to say anything about a baby being aborted in California in the ninth month. I will not do that. That is not required by our Constitution. Now, Mike Pence said today he would sign my bill limiting abortion on demand at 15 weeks. 47 of 50 European nations limit abortion from 12 to 15 weeks. The Democratic proposal is abortion on demand up to the moment of birth using taxpayer dollars, making us like China and North Korea. Do you understand the line I'm trying to draw? Our Constitution is about life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, right? How can you pursue happiness if you're dead? So here's what I'm telling you. The Dobbs decision said the following. On the question of abortion, the Constitution is therefore neither pro-life nor pro-choice. The Constitution is neutral and leaves the issue for the people and their elected representatives to resolve through the democratic process in the states or Congress, like the numerous other difficult questions of American social and economic policy the Constitution does not address. The decision is saying, folks, that we in Congress can if we choose. I challenge everybody wanting to be the standard bearer for the Republican Party to be proudly pro-life. You should want to talk about this. You need to talk about this. If you're going to represent our party, the first thing you need to look in the camera and say, I will fight with everything in my being to make sure America does not become China when it comes to abortion. At 15 weeks, a baby can suck its thumb you provide anesthesia to save its life when you operate it. If I am president of the United States, I will draw a line at 15 weeks, saving 55,000 babies from an excruciating death. I will be in Washington for the unborn. If we're not willing to say that, we really never meant it was about the baby. What's the pro-life movement about? It's about the child. It's not about geography. Does it matter where you're conceived? No. If you're conceived in California at 15 weeks, you feel pain. And 47 of 50 European nations outlaw abortion at that moment in time. Our Democratic friends would make this the most radical place on the planet when it comes to the life issue. The only thing between them and their bill is us. So I want the nominee of our great party to not only go on the stage and debate Joe Biden by saying, hey, Joe, I'm over here. I want him to look Joe Biden in the eye and say, where would you limit at all, if at all, abortion? They won't tell you. They won't pick a week. They don't want Roe v. Wade. They want abortion on demand up to the moment of birth using your money. That is their bill. We need, a, we need an alternative. We need to let states do everything they can to help the unborn. But at 15 weeks, we're going to draw a line. We're going to save babies in California. We're going to stand up for the unborn in Washington, D.C. And if you cannot do that, you should not be the nominee for the Republican Party. This is a defining moment. God bless you all. Here's the good news. We got great candidates wanting to be our standard bearer. Donald Trump was the best pro-life president in my lifetime. He's awesome. Mike Pence, one of the most decent men, said today he would sign my bill. Tim Scott uh, wrote an op-ed, people, count me in for saving babies from an excruciating death at 15 weeks. Come on, folks. The war is not won. The fight continues. They will, if you let them, the Democratic Party, wipe out every pro-law in the country. We're not going to let them, and we're going to let, we're going to turn Washington into a place where the pro-life movement is welcome. And we're going to set a national minimum standard at 15 weeks to make sure we're not barbaric. I'm for federalism, but federalism doesn't require me to sit on the sidelines and watch our nation become China. I'm not going to do that. The law is with us. God is with us. We're going to win. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chairman of the Iowa Faith and Freedom Coalition, Steve Scheffler. Good morning. I'm honored to introduce Governor Asa Hutchinson, the 46th Governor of Arkansas. He served as the U.S. Attorney, Chairman of the National Governors Association, a U.S. Congressman, Administrator of the Drug Enforcement Administration, Undersecretary for Border and Transportation Security, and as an Iowan, I am proud that he has come to my state, like other candidates for president, talking to everyday Iowans and making his case. Please welcome my good friend, Governor Asa Hutchinson. Thank you. It is so great to be at Faith of Freedom today. I was asked, why is it important to be here? And that is because faith guides me in my private life, and it's important for faith to guide us in our public life as well. I look back at uh, my time, and I want to express my appreciation to Ralph Reed for Steve and his leadership in Iowa, but for you being here and to encourage us as public leaders and candidates. But to see you in the trenches makes all the difference in our public life. My family is important to me. I've been married to my wife, Susan, for 49 years. We have, we have four children and seven grandchildren, and my grandchildren are important to me. I'll never forget that uh, when I was in the private sector, I had to go over to Abu Dhabi in the Middle East. And I was trying to explain to my five-year-old grandson that I was going to have to be gone. He tried to understand Abu Dhabi. He didn't get it exactly right. He goes to his kindergarten class and he tells his fellow classmates that Papa was going to have to spend the weekend in Hobby Lobby. <laughs> my faith has always guided me in the public arena. And I have been fighting for our values that we believe in for faith and freedom since I got involved as a young lawyer in our community. I went to Bob Jones University. I understand how biblical values impact your life in whatever profession you're in. I had the privilege of going to Notre Dame when Francis Schaeffer was alive, and he had a religious freedom conference there in which I was there as a young lawyer, and I heard him talk about the book, How Shall We Then Live? And whenever you look at the biblical worldview and you look at the secular worldview, we have so much to fight for in terms of our faith and freedom. We are on this earth to impact our community and make a difference for eternity. And that is why, as a young professional, as a young parent, I started and worked with others, my brother, to start a Christian school because I believed in choice and education. I started Bentonville's first FM radio station in which we put John MacArthur on and James Dobson and Chuck Swindoll because I wanted our community to be exposed to, to these great Bible teachers. In 1986, when I ran for the United States Senate, I went to my first Right for Life rally in Little Rock, Arkansas. And at that time, I was the only public official there. I wasn't a public official, I was a candidate. The only one there. And I said, Roe versus Wade needs to be reversed. It was wrongly decided. That was a long time ago. And thanks to you and your education, your advocacy, we have won that battle, and the Supreme Court has acted and reversed it. I served the United States Congress on the Judiciary Committee. Chairman Hyde was there, and I had to fight for our pro-life values. I had to fight for our Second Amendment, and I, did, I waged battle with Congressman Nadler, Maxine Waters, and Barney Frank. And so I have stood in the trenches fighting for our values, and as governor of Arkansas for eight years, let me tell you, it was my honor to sign over 30 pro-life bills. And Arkansas has been ranked, after eight years of my leadership, as the number one pro-life state in America by Americans United for Life. I signed the medical conscience bill 
saying that medical providers can follow their conscience whenever it comes to medical care. I signed the bill that said biological men should not be competing in women's sports. <laughs> and when we got notice from the Obama administration, from their Department of Education, that went directly to our school superintendents that you need to make sure that the students can choose their own gender, gender identity bathroom. I looked at that and I announced publicly that our school superintendents can ignore that advice from Washington. It is federal overreach. It is not something that is required under the law. And they took my advice and we handled it based upon parents and local school board decisions. Whenever Planned Parenthood was investigated and it came to me that they were not handling the issues appropriately in their clinics. I asked our Medicaid division to decertify Planned Parenthood, and we did. <laughs> We've given $1 million to support pro-life pregnancy Christ centers across the state. These are pro-life values that I have supported as governor and throughout my public career. And yes, as president, I would fight to make sure taxpayers funded Taxpayer funds are not used to support abortion. And if Congress acts, and if Congress acts, I will sign a federal law to restrict abortion as well as President of the United States. Now let's look at the important role of parents, and let me outline some important principles. First of all, there's a fundamental principle of faith and freedom, and that is that parents are God's guiding hands in raising children. <laughs> Secondly, the government should not force parents to send their children to a government school. It's called choice in education. It is called freedom. Third, God created two genders. And children should not be confused on this. But if there is confusion, parents, not the government, should guide the children. <laughs> and schools should not hide these issues from the parents. And then let me say this, that minors should not be allowed to have gender reassignment surgery. <laughs> this is a valid limit on important constitutional liberties. And we should remember that under our Constitution and freedoms, the liberty interest of parents in the care, custody, and control of the children is perhaps the oldest of the fundamental liberty interests recognized in our Constitution. I don't want the left-leaning governments in California to tell parents what kind of care they need to provide for their children. Those are the rights that are fundamental to parents. And so what can you expect from a Hutchins administration? By the way, I am running for president of the United States. <laughs> you can expect a pro-growth energy policy where we're going to produce energy again in this country. As former head of the DEA, you can expect us to address the fentanyl crisis in America. As former undersecretary at Homeland Security that had responsibility for securing our border, let me tell you, I know what needs to be done, and we can do better than what this administration has done. We can secure the border. <laughs> and we need economic growth in this country that is based upon individual responsibility and opportunity for everyone. We need to kick our economy going. And then we need to have an America that is not second to China. I was appointed by Ronald Reagan as United States Attorney, so he's a mentor of mine. And he understood that peace comes from strength, that we need to lead this global uh, marketplace of Western ideas and culture. We need to lead in freedom. That's what America stands for. And let me tell you that these are unpredictable times that we find ourselves in. Difficult times, challenging times. 
and we need new leadership to replace the failed policies of President Biden. We need leadership that understands our national character, our national character that is individual responsibility, that is, that is freedom-based, that is opportunity, but it is also reflecting the goodness of America that is manifested by Christians all across this country, people of faith. That's what a president of the United States should reflect. And I want to be a president that brings out the best of America. I understand the challenging times that we face, and I'm reminded of the scripture verse in Isaiah 6-1, where the prophet said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high, exalted, and seated on his throne. Those were traumatic times when King Uzziah died because he had been there a long time. And people were shaken by it. And I would reflect today that sometimes we think our foundations are shaken. But let's remember in this country that God is still on his throne. That God is still in control of the affairs of humans. And we need to trust, we need to ask his guidance, we need to seek his blessing on the United States of America. Thank you and God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Executive Director of the North Carolina Faith and Freedom Coalition, Jason Williams. Yes! Man, so I assume you guys heard a few minutes ago uh, my good friend, good friend Mac from Georgia, uh, yeah, yeah, great, great crowd. We, we, we love Mac. But, but he tried to point out the, the great, uh, great crowd we have from our friends in Georgia. We love you guys. But what, one more time, where's our North Carolina contingency today? Where are you guys at? That's, that's uh, Now I see you. There we are. Okay. It's a little dark in here. I had to make sure. I had to make sure. Well, well we're certainly very well aware of who this next guy is. And, and you're about to be introduced to one of the most dynamic speakers in our movement in the nation right now. Uh, somebody who's become one of my closest friends. And, and really, when you think about where we are and the fact that we need a fighter, we need fighters in politics, in the political arena. And, and can I tell you something real quick of how you do that? Uh, you know, you don't have to be a, a smart political consultant genius like I am. <laughs> but I'm going to give you some, some, pull back the curtain a little bit and give you some information. The way you get those kind of fighters is you elect those kind of fighters. You elect people that believe the way that we believe. And if you want to get those people in office that promote those values, you elect people that believe and promote those values. And I want to tell you that in North Carolina next year, we've got that opportunity. We've got an opportunity to elect a fighter, somebody that will stand with us, he believes like us, and he's going to go back and make sure that, that he fights against this woke liberal agenda and he fights against the liberal media tooth and nail every day. I want you to give a strong road to majority, Tar Heel welcome to the North Carolina Lieutenant Governor and the next Governor of North Carolina, my friend Mark Robinson. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. Thank you, Jason, for that great introduction. And as always, we thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for giving us our life and our health and our strength and for placing us in a blessed and prosperous land. You know, this, this land that we live in called America, I believe she was touched by God. I believe that when God heard those words, when he saw those words penned, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. 
God heard that from heaven and said, finally, there is a people who understand that their rights don't come from the king or queen or from the Congress or from the parliament. They come from me. And so he said, I know they have problems, but I will stand with them and I will stand above them and I will stand under them and I will help them through every difficulty that they face. And he has, and he has richly blessed this nation. Because of that, each and every one of us, when we rise up in the morning, I believe we should give thanks to God Almighty for blessing us to put us in such a nation and to being with us along the way. So here we are in this blessed nation. What is happening in this blessed nation? Right now, our border is wide open. Any and everybody can come across our border unchecked. We have no idea who is coming across and what their purpose is for coming across. Of course, many of the people that are coming across that border are simply running from despotism, running towards freedom, running towards a better way of life, but with them. There's a whole parcel of people who mean us no good, who intend to commit acts of terrorism, possibly, who intend to commit uh, atrocities like drug dealing, gang banging, human trafficking. That border is wide open. And along with that, all of our enemies are lined up now to try to destroy the U.S. dollars, to try to bring the United States of America down. Russia is in Ukraine. China is eyeing Taiwan. And they're all partnering together to see that the United States of America falls. On our streets, law enforcement has been denigrated, has been destroyed. Law and order is being destroyed, and we have a two-tiered justice system that has been weaponized against political enemies, much like it was during Hitler's reign and Mao's reign, Stalin's reign. It's not the United States that I remember as a child anymore. We are in a precarious position where if we do not make the right moves in 2024, this nation will fall. What is the right move? The right move, number one, is to get someone into office who puts America first. Someone who understands that they are the, the president of the United States of America, not the president of the world, the president of the United States of America. Vladimir Putin puts Russia first. The president of China puts China first. The man in Brazil puts Brazil first. The man in our office puts ice cream first. <laughs> Today, America needs a fighter indeed. This nation needs a fighter. Someone who is willing to go onto the world stage, walk in boldly, strongly, waving the American flag, saying the Americans are here and we are in charge again. And we are going to lead this world into the future with freedom. That's what America needs and that is why on this stage today, I am endorsing Donald J. Trump as the President of the United States of America in 2024. Because now, doggone it, is the time for warriors to stand up and get it done. No more of this soft talk. No more of this easy speak. No more of it. It's time to put away the cigars and the, th and the, and the pipes and the cross legs and the calm conversation. This nation is at war and we need a warrior at the helm. And that's why I'm endorsing him right now on this stage. Well, here it is. I'm supposed to have a timer here. I don't see it, for, so for the next two hours, you all are stuck with me. Well, here I am. Here I am. Back in North Carolina, my home state. Don't mean no, don't mean no harm to any of y'all. The greatest state in the union. Love all the other states, but my home state is where I love. And so we call it the greatest state in the union. We have a wonderful state back home. 
And uh, a few weeks back, I made the announcement that I'm running for governor of that state. And not only are we running for governor, but doggone it, we're going to win. There's some naysayers out there that say, oh, that guy, he, he can't win the race. He's too far right. He's he, something wrong with him. He's crazy. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Uh, crazy because I want to make sure that we take the blessed economy that we have that was formed by Republicans and make sure it spreads all across the state. I'm crazy because of that. No, sir. No, ma'am. I'm crazy because I believe that parents... Parents should be in charge of their children's educational destiny. I'm crazy because I believe there's only two genders and that boys should be running against girls at the track meet, swimming against uh, girls at the, at the swim meet, wrestling against girls down at the wrestling meet. I'm crazy because of that. I'm crazy because I don't believe that our children should be presented with pornography. Especially not in their public schools. Simple fact of the matter is, I'm not crazy. Because normal, ordinary, looks crazy to the insane. And what we're facing is the insane. So if they want to call me crazy, they want to call you crazy, let them call us that. Yes, sir. I look crazy to you because you're insane. Because I'm not doing the abnormal things that you're doing. Because I want my state to actually be better. Because I want to work towards a greater day. and See a, fi a finer future. You know, in North Carolina, we're doing great in North Carolina, our economy is. And it's all due to the move of conservative Republicans who have... Uh, transformed our economy in our state. But like I said, we need to expand that economy all across and make sure that that economy is serving the entire state so our state can continue to grow. And in education, there are a ton of things we need to do in education. We need to ensure that our children understand how to read and write and do arithmetic. Yes. That we teach them how their constitutional republic works that we teach them how capitalism works, not socialism, because it doesn't work. A whole host of other things we need to do as well. But the major thing we need to do as conservatives, this thing now all of a sudden says, please stop, your time is up. I'm gonna tell you like the little cartoon character used to, used to say, you're too late. The major thing we need to do as conservatives is this, and this is what I plan to do in North Carolina. I plan to get out into the streets and tell the great story of what conservatism does. You see, conservatism builds up. It doesn't tear down. Conservatism encourages and gives opportunities. It does not build the welfare state. Conservatism believes in the time-honored values that produce the desired result every time, i.e., we believe in principles, not just ideas. And those principles yield the result. Look at, look at what's going on in California. The state is falling apart. The state of New York is falling apart. The state of Illinois is falling apart. Meanwhile, the state of Texas is growing. The state of Arkansas is growing. The state of North Carolina is growing. The state of Florida is growing. South Carolina is growing. Tennessee is growing. South Dakota is growing. Why? Because it is run by principles. Principles built on wisdom and the almighty. Solid principles that work. And we plan to bring those same principles to North Carolina. So yeah, go ahead leftists. Call me crazy if you want. Guess who I'm crazy like? I'm crazy like that first guy in this nation who stood up and said, why can't America be free? Why do we have to be subjects of the British? I'm crazy like that first person that stood up and said that slavery is not compatible with a nation that declares that it is built on independence. I'm crazy uh, like those boys that charge down Little Round Top 
and like those boys who charged up uh, that hill on Iwo Jima. Crazy like those people on the Edmund Pettus Bridge and a hundred and a thousand other places across the South in the 60s who dared to stand up and demand to be treated as equals, who sat down at lunch counters but stood up for freedom to declare that they were just as much man as anyone else. Yes, called me crazy like them. Called me crazy like those of us who believe in the Almighty, who have seen his works in our lives, who have seen his works in this nation, and know, and know that through his wisdom and through his strength and through his divine intervention, which we pray for continuously on a daily basis, that this nation, no, I will not stop. This nation will survive. This nation will move forward. This nation will be what it, God wants it to be. And the people in it who want to destroy it, I send you a message today. There are warriors in your path and you will have to defeat us to take this nation down because we are here, we are ready, we are willing to fight because what God has blessed us with will not go easily into the night. You'll have to do it over our dead bodies. So let's stand together, let's fight together, let's save America together, and let's save every state in this nation and the people along with it. God bless you, God bless this Washington DC, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of Faith and Freedom Coalition African American Voices, Maggie Nicholas. Hello, everyone. My name is Maggie Nicholas, and I'm here to introduce to you Senator Tim Scott, U.S. Senator from South Carolina, served in the South Carolina General Assembly, represented South Carolina First Congressional District, and college, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, led him to his Christian faith. A champion for school choice, he and Senator Cassidy introduced the Ed Educational Choice for Children Act. Please welcome Senator Tim Scott. How are you doing out there? I once heard that the era of value voters was over, someone wrote recently. I'm so excited that they were dead wrong. I'm looking around here and I see people just like me who have faith on their sleeves, Jesus in their hearts, and we're just getting started. I'll say this, the truth of my life disproves the lies of the radical left. They want to divide our country according to race and create tribes, but I'm here to say, not on my watch. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll say this, there's no question. When you think about the radical left and their agenda, we have to start with tomorrow's anniversary, and thank God Almighty for the Dobbs decision. Yes. Absolutely. We are creating a culture of life in America, and that's a really good thing. But I will say, without any question, the Secretary of the Treasury was in the middle of a banking hearing, and I'm on the banking committee, and I heard the Secretary of the Treasury, the second most powerful woman in the Biden administration, say that poor black women should have abortions to improve their labor force participation rate. I said to myself, I could not have heard that right. I know y'all don't know this, but I'm black. 
And so I said to myself, my mother, a single parent, mired in poverty, made the decision for life. And I thank God Almighty that she chose to bring me in the world. So I ran down to my banking hearing to ask Secretary Yellen myself, just to see if I heard her right. And she said, she doubled down on it. She said, absolutely, in order to increase black employment and black opportunity, abortion is an alternative. What a desperate position to take. The radical left has lost so much faith in America, they've lost faith in life itself, but we are here to tell them, life is good, and we are proud to be Americans. We are proud to live in the freest, fairest land on God's green earth. Well, I said the truth of my life disproves the lies of the radical left, and I said that because not only was the secretary yelling, but then the ladies on The View, Joy, Joy Behar told me, I don't know what it feels like to be black. <laughs> I was like, let me go on that show and have a conversation with the women of The View. Because I got to say, their comments were offensive and dangerous and disgusting. And so I went on The View and said, your comments are offensive, dangerous, and disgusting. Because to suggest that the only way for a child of color to make it in this nation is to be the exception and not the rule is a lie from the pit of hell. A lie from the pit of hell. But then President Obama decided to jump in as well. I can't hear you. Oh, okay. I heard you. I heard you. Okay. He says, I'm too optimistic. I have been accused of being too optimistic, too positive, too proud to be an American. For those accounts, I am guilty. Guilty as charged. I love America. I love our country. I love our country because I had a miserable beginning. I started off on the wrong foot. My parents got divorced when I was seven years old. We moved into my grandparents' house. My grandfather was born in 1921 in a very segregated South Carolina. But he believed back then what too many doubt right now. He believed in having stubborn faith. Faith in God, faith in yourself, and faith in what America could be. And when we moved in, he said to me, as a seven-year-old, you can be bitter or you can be better, but you can't be both. <laughs> My family chose patriotism, not pity. We chose that this is the land of opportunity, not the land of oppression. And my mother said, God bless my mom. She worked 16 hours a day as a nurse's aide, changing bedpans and rolling patients. And she came home and she would tell me every single day in her own way, there is dignity in all work. And that's why I know as a nation, if you are able-bodied, you work. If, if you take out a loan, you pay it back. And if you commit a violent crime, you go to jail. These are American values. And myself, as a kid, I went to four different elementary schools by the fourth grade. It's one of the reasons why I believe that every parent needs a choice so every child has a chance. We must make sure that every zip code in this nation is empowered with school choice so that our kids do not have to be indoctrinated, but they get educated. And that we quit teaching CRT and we start teaching ABC. It's time for us to get back to teaching American history in the United States of America. But the Biden administration and the radical left, they refuse 
They refuse to allow our kids to be educated. So when parents show up at board, school board meetings, they label them domestic terrorists. That's wrong. When pro-life activists exercise their First Amendment rights, the SWAT team shows up, guns blazing at a home because of a pro-life activist exercising their First Amendment rights. But even worse, in this radical left Biden administration, they weaponize the Department of Justice against their political enemies. That is wrong. We deserve better in the United States of America. We deserve better. I wish, and as President of the United States, I would change the trajectory of this nation by focusing on restoring confidence and integrity in the DOJ, because we will first fire Joe Biden, second, fire Merrick Garland, third, fire Chris Ray at the FBI. And then we will turn our attention to our southern border and build a wall and close our southern border. We are going to stop 70,000 Americans from losing their lives to fentanyl because of the precursors that come from China, manufactured in Mexico, and Mexican cartels bringing it across our border. Not on my watch. They will cease to exist. And then we'll turn our attention to China. China is an existential threat to our nation. And we should deal with them as such. They are spying on our kids, buying our farmlands, and breaching our sovereign borders while setting up a base in Cuba. It is time to have a president of the United States who has a backbone and will stand toe to toe with China and say, never again, not in Cuba, not in South America, and not in the United States of America. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Faith and Freedom Coalition Hispanic Division Director, Nilsa Alvarez. Hey everyone, so I get to present our next speaker. He served, he serves as the 43rd Mayor of Miami served as part of the Miami City Commission from 2009 to 2017. His three major themes of governance are quality of life, a pathway to prosperity and resiliency. Uh, he also served as president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors from 2022 to 2023. Please welcome Mayor Francis Suarez. I think we got some Hispanics in the house. Yeah. Bienvenidos. I would say bienvenidos on Miami, but we're not in Miami. Dr. Reed, honored guests, esteemed colleagues, brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you so much for having me here today. I believe in Godfidences. They're all around us. Just last night, as I arrived at the hotel, I was tired. 
beaten and a bit broken. I did seven interviews yesterday, including The View. <laughs> I know, I'm still alive to tell it. I was waiting for the elevators, and then I saw some friendly, smiling faces, which as you know, is the spiritual fuel for any public servant. I saw the faces of Betty Cardenas and her son, aptly named Abraham. They lead a group called Bienvenidos Empresarios, a network of over 10,000 Hispanic churches. For people in my position, our fuel is inspiration and grace. And they gave it to me last night in abundance. So I just want to say, gracias de la profundidad de mi corazón. And to let them know that I look forward to continuing my mission of service with their organization. How many of you in this audience get daily scripture readings sent to you from someone? Raise your hand. I want to share with you the two that I received this morning. They were sent to me by Malcolm Nicholas. Malcolm is a vice principal of an inner city high school in Miami. He lost his son tragically to gun violence. I know of no one with greater faith than Malcolm. This morning he sent me two passages. The first is my favorite passage from the New Testament. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again. Rejoice. The second is that every circumstance is an opportunity to learn how to serve God, including this very opportunity. I want to commend every public official and every presidential candidate who had the courage to come here today and be a part of this amazing gathering. I want to also express my profound gratitude to God for the celebration of the anniversary of what historians will call the greatest day for defending life in our history, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. How many great people will be born in the future that can shape our world and can cure diseases who may never have been given a chance. Let's also pray for our Supreme Court justices as they weather the storm of criticism for protecting innocent life and upholding the rule of law in the face of a secular world that inundates us with a counter message. I want to also thank the countless Americans who comprise the pro-life movement and who are building a culture of life based on the gospel. I am literally a product of the pro-life movement myself. My parents actually met at a pro-life rally. <laughs> they have bravely lived their pro-life ethic by raising a family of four, myself and my three sisters. My parents and the difficulties of my own life taught me that faith must be at the center of our lives and that faith in Jesus Christ is the center of my life. I can tell you without hesitation that the most important part of my day is the, the time that I spent with Jesus. It's the relationship that shapes all other relationships. It allowed me to find and marry the love of my life, Gloria, who is here with me today. I don't know where she is, but I know she's here somewhere. There she is. Stand up, honey. There you go. And my faith has formed my commitment to the culture of life from its inception until its end. You know, many people claim to be pro-life, but you're not pro-life until you're truly tested. In my case, my wife and I were tested by the challenge of infertility. We struggled with infertility for four years. We accepted the possibility that we would not feel the joys of parenthood, that our only children may be the forgotten children of my city. 
And then on Father's Day 2013, I woke up and heard my wife screaming, I don't know if it's true, I don't know if it's true. And of course, as a politician, the first thing I said was, it's not true, whatever it is. <laughs> she opened the door and said in a hysterical voice, if it's true, it's gonna be your first Father's Day. You see, there are moments in life where God's intervention is so powerful, so tangible, and this was one of the many moments for me. My immediate family has also been inspired by the power of the pro-life witness of family by my niece. My sister, who is one of my heroes. By the way, all my sisters are my heroes. I don't want to get home and have to hear from the other ones. Has five children. No small feat for a working mom. But when she received the wonderful news that she was having her fourth child, almost immediately it came with the news that she would be born with a genetic deficiency which would severely handicap her throughout her life and undoubtedly increase the burden on an already large family. In one of the most incredible acts of faith and courage I have ever witnessed, she kept her child. Gianna. And she taught all of us how to truly live our faith. Her faith was so great that she even went on to have a fifth child, a precocious little boy named Paolo Antonio. Gianna, I want to tell you today, your parents love you, I love you, and God loves you. You know, in churches across America, I'm sure you've heard this, they say they see the glory, but they don't know the real story. <laughs> Living your faith and proclaiming it in today's America means bearing witness in the face of a hostile environment and a relentless media. It means inspiring people towards faith through the power of your actions rather than the loudness of your words. It means leading, loving, and forgiving for a better country. You know, I could tell you about Miami's lowest murder rate in a generation and cutting crime to historic lows. I could tell you about our cutting taxes to the lowest rate ever. And I could tell you about how our new tech economy is growing and how we have created a Miami charter school network driven by parents and not bureaucrats. But I want to tell you about my own journey as a young man. I was the victim of a home invasion robbery where I saw my mother and my grandmother held at gunpoint. It left me scared and scarred with what today would probably be diagnosed as PTSD. I bounced around different schools trying to grapple with the emotions and the aftermath of the event. And then I met Father Pat Angelucci. He transformed me by teaching me to re be, be reborn in Christ and that my faith needed to be the bedrock of my strength and self-worth. I remember like it was yesterday, pulling up to school and saying, what's up, Father? And him saying, heaven boy. I remember him telling the story of the touch of the master's hand and that the master, God, is constantly molding us and gently asking us to follow his path, even at this very moment. He taught me that we find God when we focus on the least, the last, and the lost. Well, I am grateful for our city's economic success and our gains in public safety. I am most grateful for our success in helping the forgotten and the marginalized. Homelessness is exploding across our country. In Miami, we have taken a different approach. Our homeless population, which peaked at 6,000, as of our last census, is at 600 
and eight, and we will not stop. We will not stop until we get to zero. I can tell you that. We did it by applying Christian values and by joining hands with churches across the city and faith-based organizations like Hermanos de la Calle, who've taken over a thousand people off the streets and placed them in permanent housing. I like to talk about how we reduced poverty in the last 20 years by 50% because we were compassionate and found creative ways to create affordable housing, remove food deserts, and create pathways to prosperity for our homeless by teaching them vocational skills, giving our children savings accounts, and raising private sector dollars so that all young adults on Pell Grants in my city can go to college for free. Like I said, predominantly private sector dollars, almost no public sector dollars. In today's America, we need to lead with loving truth in a world of soft lies. We need Christians who speak clearly and calmly in a time of confusion and despair. And we need Christians who lead and who love courageously, even to those who persecute us and prosecute us. Our country is bruised and battered right now, but our faith is strong. Our values are under relentless attack, but our faith is strong. We face oppression and persecution, but our faith is strong. And all of us here today, I promise you, have been attacked, but our faith is strong. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart for keeping the faith, for keeping us strong. Thank you for keeping America one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Faith and Freedom Coalition Director of Legislative Affairs, Patrick Pertil. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Very good. It is my pleasure to be able to introduce to you a gentleman that I worked with at the Department of Justice in the Bush administration, where he spent six years as one of the most effective U.S. attorneys in the nation. He went on to become the 55th governor of New Jersey, where not only did he have a hostile state legislature, he was able to move through some of the most uh, impressive fiscal reforms the state has ever seen, both on taxes and on spending, a champion for charter schools, a champion for school choice. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Governor Chris Christie. Good morning. First of all, thank you all for being here and for loving our country enough to be here. And I thought this morning the most appropriate issue to discuss is the issue of character. And I want to start, you can tell I'm getting older, I have to put these on, but I wanted to start with Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and it is character that produces hope. Character is tested most when you're challenged, when you're under duress. And believe me, being a conservative Republican in the state of New Jersey is duress. <laughs> One million more registered Democrats than Republicans. A Democratic legislature for every day of my governorship. And the New York and Philadelphia media market every day. There is no doubt that as a conservative Republican in New Jersey, you're challenged. 
And when I was one of only three people, three Republicans, in the last 30 years to beat an incumbent Democratic governor, they told me there was no chance I could win. And one of the biggest reasons the press said I couldn't win was because I ran as what I am, an unabashedly pro-life Republican. Now, what does that mean once you become governor of New Jersey? What it means is that for eight years, they sent me Planned Parenthood funding in New Jersey, and for eight years, I vetoed it, and we sustained every one of those vetoes. No Planned Parenthood funding for eight years. And being pro-life, I would suggest to all of you, has to be longer than the nine months in the womb. Every life I was taught is a precious gift from God. And that life and its gift doesn't end when the child is born, it only begins. And our need to protect that life only begins then. And so that's why when I look at children across our state and now across our nation who live in an educational system that gives them no chance and no hope to ever lift themselves out of poverty. That is a sin. It is a sin against what God gave them in the potential that he put inside of every little boy and little girl born into this country. And that's why we opened more charter schools than at any time in New Jersey history. That's why we gave parents parental choice and what we need in this country is to radically change the education system so that every parent, regardless of how much money you make, gets to choose where their child goes and what they learn. That's gonna be the defining issue of the next 20 years in our country. And when I was U.S. Attorney, I worked with Congressman Chris Smith to make sure that human traffickers were prosecuted not only in New Jersey, but all across our region. If we are gonna stand up for the preciousness of life, we must stand up for the young women that are trafficked into this country, into the sex trade. Those people who profit from those young women need to be prosecuted and put in jail for the rest of their lives. I did the biggest one of those cases in the country's history. And character, is important and has been important in every one of the moments in our country's history. Think about it. If in 1776, Washington and Adams and Jefferson and Franklin had decided to negotiate with King George and not have the character and the courage it took to stand up for independence, which they knew had freedom and liberty, we'd be a smaller country. If in 1861, Abraham Lincoln decided to give the South away, rather than stand up and have the character to say that a house divided against itself cannot stand, we would not have the country that we have today. In 1941, if Franklin Roosevelt hadn't said that Holocaust around the world and Nazi domination was something the United States was unwilling to live with, well, we would have been a smaller country today, not the leader of the world that we became. And in 1981, if Ronald Reagan had been willing to live with a Soviet empire that killed and discriminated its own, against its own people, that squashed its faith, then we would not have seen nine years later the falling of the Berlin Wall and now a free and democratic Europe that helps to support the hope and the faith of each and every one of those people. Our faith teaches us, at least my Catholic faith, teaches us that character doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you're free of sin or faults. But what I believe my faith requires of me is when I do sin, when I do make mistakes, when people who work for me do the same, that I must admit it, that I must take responsibility, that part of getting forgiveness, whether it's from God or whether it's from the people who elected you when you make mistakes, is to first accept that responsibility and ask for forgiveness. That's what character really is.
because beware, everybody, of a leader who never makes mistakes. Beware of a leader who has no faults. Beware of a leader who says that when something goes wrong, it's everybody else's fault. And he goes and he blames those people for anything that goes wrong, but when things go right, everything is to his credit. Now, there are, there are a lot of people, a lot of people who wonder, after I was the first candidate to endorse Donald Trump in 2016, the very first, <laughs> after, after he made me chairman of his transition, after he made me chairman of his opioid and drug abuse commission, after, and this one will keep you up at night, everybody, after I played Hillary Clinton in debate prep. You won't be able to sleep thinking about that one tonight. And after I played Joe Biden in debate prep in 2020, why am I running for president of the United States? I'm running because he's let us down. He has let us down because he's unwilling. He's unwilling to take responsibility for any of the mistakes that were made. Any, uh, any of the faults that he has and any of the things that he's done. And that is not leadership, everybody. That is a failure of leadership. And I, you can boo all you want. But here's the thing. Our faith teaches us that people have to take responsibility for what they do. People have to stand up and take accountability for what they do. And I, I cannot stand by, and as soon as I've started to be critical, after all of that, and after you offered me White House Chief of Staff, now what he does is call me names and belittle me. And I will tell you, if all you do, if all you do is disagree with someone, and in return you get that kind of treatment, I've joined a great list of Americans like Rex Tillerson, and Jim Mattis, and Mark Esper, and Mick Mulvaney, and John Kelly, and all the rest. And you can love him all you want, but I will tell you, I will tell you that doing those kind of things makes our country smaller. It makes our country smaller, and it makes us lesser. During the Revolutionary War, Abigail Adams asked her husband John if they were going to win the war. And here's what John said. He said, I can't guarantee success in the war, but I can guarantee something better, that we deserve it. Ladies and gentlemen, you never know what's going to come across the desk of the President of the United States. It's not a litmus test of boxes checked. You need to know what's in here. We need to once again, as people of faith, put character first. If I'm President of the United States, I will put character first. I love each and every one of you for what you contribute to our country. I love that you are people of faith. I am too. And let's make America a country that cares once again about character and faith. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Chairman of the Iowa Faith and Freedom Coalition, Steve Scheffler. Good morning again. I am proud and honored to introduce my United States Senator Joan Ears. She was elected to the U.S. Senate, replacing a 30-year far-left Democrat in 2014. She was elected vice chair of the Senate Republican Co Conference. She was the first female combat veteran in the U.S. Senate. She served in the United States Army and the Iowa National Guard in the Iraq War. She has supported fetal uh, personhood amendment legislation to defund Planned Parenthood. She is the greatest. Please welcome my great U.S. Senator, Joni Ernst. It's great to be with so many.
Happy Patriots! Uh, thank you all for coming out today. So folks, Joe Biden and the Democratic Party of today don't know the difference between a man or a woman. What? And they clearly don't understand what the word secure means when it comes to our country. This utter confusion is causing chaos across the United States from our southern border all the way to competitive sports. Right now, Joe Biden is working overtime to allow biological males to share spaces with females and compete in women's sports. Doors that were opened over 50 years ago are being slammed in the faces of girls across this country because of the left's radical gender ideology. Girls' locker rooms have become a battleground. Many of you probably know my friend, Riley Gaines Barker. Yes! She's a 12-time NCAA All-American female athlete who was forced to compete against a biological male, Leah Thomas, in the 200 freestyle for the national championship. The two tied. They tied, folks, for fifth place with Thomas taking home the trophy. The NCAA told Riley it was necessary for photo purposes and that Riley would get her trophy in the mail. Yes, boo. Thank you. Folks, Leah Thomas is a six foot four biological male who swam on the men's team at the University of Pennsylvania for three years before switching to the women's team for his final year. Man, you might feel like a woman, but you're not. Thankfully, last year, my friend and fellow patriot, Governor Kim Reynolds of our great state of Iowa, yes, <laughs> protected girls' sports across the great state of Iowa from elementary all the way to the collegiate level. And in the U.S. Senate, I am proud to help lead the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act. Under our bill, under our bill, my, any athletic program that receives federal funds and allows a biological male to participate in competitions designated for women or girls would be in violation of federal law and held accountable. We, we here in this room must continue to stand up, protect our young girls, and ensure that they are not pushed off of the podium. Title, folks, Title IX is the law of the land, whether Democrats like it or not. Our female athletes deserve fairness. They deserve safety and the ability to win top scholarships and titles. No amount of harassment from the radical left will stop us from standing up for the truth and for what is right. So folks, I mentioned securing our nation. So let's talk a little bit about our border. Don't you think it's time to secure our southern border? Yeah. Joe Biden's refusal to act is allowing cartels to smuggle deadly drugs into our countries, into communities all across the United States, risking our national security and 
costing taxpayers billions of dollars for nothing. On day one in, our, in office, Joe Biden canceled the construction of the wall along our southern border, calling it, quote, a waste of money. Ironically, folks, his decision not to build the wall is the real waste of money. Right now, you, all of you as taxpayers, are spending millions of dollars for contractors to babysit piles of metal sitting in the desert. Since pulling the plug, we have been paying contractors about five, fifth, or excuse me, $50 million a year to watch over unused materials. That's right, we're being billed to protect piles of rusting materials that were supposed to be used to protect the American people. And since Joe Biden came into office, we've had 5.5 million illegal immigrants that have crossed over the U.S.-Mexico border. We have 190 Americans dying every single day to fentanyl. That's about the equivalent of a 9-11 every 15 days. So we've got to do it. Let's put these border materials to use, stop them from collecting a dust in the desert. Let's build the wall along our southern border. So folks, right now, Iowa is a hotbed of activity. We've got all kinds of candidates coming through, a lot of political tourism in the great state of Iowa. Um, but Iowa Republicans are fired up to maintain our first in the nation caucus. And just a couple of weeks ago, great event. We had a roast and ride in Iowa, all kinds of candidates coming out. Iowans piling out of their homes, coming out to support who we hope will be the next candidate uh, in the caucuses and in the race for the White House. What we know, folks, is that we must fire Joe Biden. And I have full confidence that we will take back the White House in 2024. We need all of you patriots stepping up. This is our mission, folks, is to get America on the right track. We are counting on you in 2024. So God bless you all, folks. God bless our great United States of America. Let's do it, folks. 2024. 2024. Well, welcome to the freest state in these United States. The cure cannot be worse than the actual issue. You can't run your society into the ground. Kids need to be in school. People need to be able to earn a living. Major move by Governor Ron DeSantis. The governor announcing Florida is now reopening. Florida got it right, and the lockdown states got it wrong. Tonight, a sweeping elections reform bill is now law here in Florida. Your vote is going to be cast with integrity and transparency, and this is a great place for a democracy. Governor Ron DeSantis sailed to victory, beating former Governor Charlie Crist. DeSantis winning 50% of all Latino voters in the state of Florida. Thank you for a historic landslide victory. Governor Ron DeSantis signed the Parental Rights in Education Bill. We not only know that parents have a right to be involved, we insist that parents have a right to be involved. Governor Ron DeSantis ending Disney's decades-long reign of self-governance. We fight the woke and the corporations. We refuse to surrender to the woke mob. This state is where woke goes to die. A major GOP plan for universal school vouchers, now law in the state of Florida. State of Florida is number one when it comes to education. Governor Ron DeSantis signed into law the heartbeat bill. The law bans abortions after the moment of gestational heartbeat. I'm willing to sign great life legislation. That's what I've always uh, said I would do. I can tell you in the state of Florida, I'll be holding the line. 
I'll be standing my ground. I won't back down, and I have only begun to fight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of One More Child, Jerry Haig. Over the past five years, I have seen up close the bold leadership of Governor Ron DeSantis. I've seen how lives have been changed, I see how families have been strengthened, and I've seen how futures can be brighter. Governor Ron DeSantis gets things done. He is a man of faith, and you can see that faith in his priorities, in his appointments, and in his policies. Governor DeSantis kept our church doors open during COVID. He personally, he personally led the passing of the heartbeat bill in Florida for, to protect our unborn children. But you know that so many of the problems that we face today aren't just matters of public policy, they are matters of the heart. I know this man's heart. And I know how he and Casey lead with their faith. Governor DeSantis is a fearless leader. He is wise, he is strong, and he is a champion for our faith and for our families. So please join me in welcoming to the stage that leader, my governor, and the next president of the United States, Governor Ron DeSantis. you all. Are you ready to work together so that we can send Joe Biden back to his basement in Delaware where he belongs? I'm so happy to be here. We see the problems in this country. You see the economy where you pay more for daily necessities like groceries. Meanwhile, the people in this town with all the spending, the debt, and the printing that's been done, you know, they're living high on the hog. You see a southern border that's wide open. You see illegal aliens pouring in and massive amounts of deadly narcotics coming in. You see cities that have been overrun with crime, places that have been hollowed out like San Francisco. And we see a federal government whose agencies have been weaponized against their fellow Americans, including people of faith. And underlying all that is the fact that the left is lighting the fire of a cultural revolution all across this land. The fire smolders in our schools, it smolders in corporate boardrooms, it smolders in the halls of door sanity to this nation. We will return normalcy to our communities and we will reinstate integrity across institutions. This is a time for clarity. This is a time to stand for truth. This is a time to proudly put on the full armor of God. Now, what's called for right now is leadership. And leadership means that you know what's the right thing to do. Uh, you have your sights fixated on what true north is. You don't let people divert you off course, the media, the polls, none of that. Uh, you follow through and you get things done. And I'm happy to say that's exactly what we've done in Florida. That's exactly what we will do as president. When the world went mad during COVID, when common sense suddenly became an uncommon virtue, the state of Florida stood as a citadel of freedom and a refuge of sanity for citizens all across this country. We. We refuse to let our state descend into some type of Faucian dystopia where people's freedoms were curtailed and their livelihoods were destroyed. No, we protected the right of people to worship in church. 
We protected people's freedom, their ability to work, businesses to operate, and made sure our kids could be in school every single day in person. In short, we chose freedom over Fauciism, and we are better off for having done so. We also lead in standing up for the protection of our children. And it's sad to say, but in the cultural moment we find ourselves in, our children are being targeted uh, for indoctrination in schools and programming, everything under the sun. In the state of Florida, when we saw that happening, when people wanted to put gender ideology in the schools, we drew a line in the sand and said, no, not on our watch. We are going to stand with the rights of parents. It is inappropriate for a teacher to tell a second grader that they may have been born in the wrong body or that their gender is a choice. And so we made sure to, to enact that in the law. Now, there are a lot of people in Florida that love that we did that. The parents loved it, regardless of party, because they want to focus school on the basics. They don't want schools to be tools of indoctrination. The left didn't like what we did. The media didn't like what we did. And there happened to be a, a company you may have heard of in Central Florida that didn't like what we did named Disney. And people said, you know, they're so powerful when they lean in on an issue in Florida, they always get their way. There's no way that the governor is going to be able to withstand that. And so this parents' right bill, rights bill is going to end up crashing and burning. And, you know, I know that they ran things in Florida for a long time. Uh, but all I can say is we run the state of Florida. We don't subcontract out to woke corporations in Burbank, California. So here we stand. And we signed the legislation. And we also ensured that if they're getting legacy benefits where they had their own government, that was in the 60s, I didn't do that, they were treated better than any person or company in the entire state of Florida, and yet, they were signing up for the sexualization of children, not just with this bill, but they've admitted it in their own programming. And so as a father of three, uh, that's not something that sits well with me. So we had to make the decision to say, you know, we are not going to put you on a pedestal in this state. And so we ended Disney's self-governing status in the state of Florida. And I know. And the sad thing is, no, I know, the sad thing is, is a lot of these Republicans are siding with Disney and they're attacking me. And here's what I will say. We oppose to rob our children of their innocence. And on those principles, there will be no compromise. We will fight the woke corporations. And what it all comes down to at the end of the day is we believe that parents have the right to direct the education and upbringing of their children. And we've enacted legislation to that effect. We've even empowered parents with the ability to know what curriculum is being used in their kid's school and to blow the whistle when things are inappropriate. And here's what they found. Unfortunately, and I think Florida is probably way better than a lot of other states, but even in Florida, you know, they have found pornography in the schools. So the media will say, if you get the pornography out, that that's somehow a book ban, which is a total hoax. People can buy, adults can buy books, but you have to choose what's appropriate to be in a school, what's appropriate for a classroom. You're making a decision, somebody's trying to make a decision to use tax dollars to put pornographic materials, and that's wrong. We did an event to highlight this, we called it exposing the book ban hoax, but before I talked, before the parents came up, we just played on the video screen exactly what the parents had objected to. The news stations covering our press conference had to cut their feed because they said it was too graphic to air. Well, if it's too graphic for the six o'clock news, how is it okay for a 10-year-old school child?
And I know we see debates right now about the ability of women to compete fairly in sports, and people like Riley Gaines are, are standing up for doing what's right, uh, and I appreciate all that. But in Florida, we took care of this years ago. Uh, we signed legislation that says every girl, every women athlete in the state of Florida has the right to compete with fairness and with integrity in their sports. And as the father of two daughters, uh, I want my daughters to be able to participate uh, with fairness and integrity. And yes, when you have someone swim on the men's team for three years and switch to the women's team and somehow win the championship, that took a championship away from a woman swimmer. That is taking opportunities away from girls. No question about that. But even more than that, when the NCAA crowns that swimmer the women's champion, they're not only taking away opportunities for other women athletes, they are asking us to be complicit in a fraud. And that I refuse to do. We have also taken action to prohibit puberty blockers and gender surgeries in the state of Florida for minors. It is mutilation, it is wrong, and it has no place in a free society. We're proud that uh, we've been able to and will continue to stand for religious liberty. And yes, we had to do that during COVID when you had local governments trying to crack down on people uh, that wanted to attend church. Uh, we filed an executive order saying churches are essential activity and have a right to operate. We've also taken action to ensure that athletes have the right and sports teams have a right to say prayers before games and also to have a mandatory moment of silence in our schools so that students can pray before they start the school day. My government in Florida has enlisted the faith community uh, into everything we do. When we work to help less fortunate people, and my wife has a great program called Hope Florida, we know that just giving somebody a check from a bureaucracy is not gonna ultimately change the trajectory of their lives. So what have we done? Uh, we've created something called the Care Portal where people in need can say what they need, but then groups in the community, businesses, nonprofit, and yes, our churches and synagogues are able to connect. They can help the people, and guess what? Once they are in the hands of people who care, uh, once they have an ability to not just receive statecraft but soulcraft, we never see them come to the government office again for help. They are on the road to self-sufficiency. So we've embraced the faith community, and we know that it works to embrace the faith community. We've also empowered parents to be able to send their kid to the school of their choice, including religious schools. You have universal school choice in the state of Florida, the largest expansion of school choice in American history. We were proud to be able to get that done. We also said when I ran for governor uh, that I would be the most pro-Israel governor in the country, and we have delivered on that promise. We stand with the state of Israel. We have fought, we have fought companies who have tried to stigmatize Israel through things like BDS, and we've put them on our dink list, and we've gotten companies like Airbnb to back down, because we understand places like Judea and Samaria are historical, biblical Jewish lands. They are not occupied territory. It is disputed territory, but those have a strong connection to the Jewish people going back thousands and thousands of years, and all you have to do is open up your Bible and start reading to see that. So as president, we will ensure that we have an ironclad Israel-US relationship. They are our ally, and we need to act like it. We also understand the importance of leading on the courts. When I became governor of Florida, our state Supreme Court in Florida was perhaps the most liberal Supreme Court anywhere in the United States. Well, we've now been able to make seven appointments to that court, and Florida now has the most conservative Supreme Court anywhere in these United States. 
and we got more work to do. As president, I will nominate and appoint justices to the Supreme Court in the mold of Justices Clarence Thomas and Justice Samuel Alito. We will also stand and defend them against scurrilous attacks that you're seeing in the media and by left-wing groups. The left knows they have lost control of the court and they don't like it. If they're able to sweep in 24, they're gonna pack the US Supreme Court with liberal justices. You may have 13 people on the Supreme Court after they get done with it and they will install a liberal majority. So they're hard at this effort of trying to lay the groundwork for that by delegitimize, delegitimizing our great conservative justices. And let me just say, um, I stand with Justice Thomas, I stand with Justice Alito in the face of these attacks. They are wrong. We have also delivered in Florida on promoting a culture of life. And that means signing the heartbeat bill into law that protects unborn children when there's a detectable heartbeat. It was the right thing to do. Don't let anyone tell you it wasn't. But we understand that, that being pro-life starts there, but it doesn't end there. In the state of Florida, we've enacted family-friendly policies. We now have the elimination of all sales tax on all baby items. Diapers, wipes, cribs, strollers, clothes, you name it, that's in the bag. Now, my wife and I have a six, five, and a three-year-old, and when I signed this into law recently, I had a big smile on my face. I came home, and she deadpanned to me, because our kids are out of diapers now, and she said, why didn't you do this four years ago? <laughs> well, you know, we did a lot over these four years, but we're really proud of that, and we're proud of all the support that we've offered for foster care, for adoptions, and for single moms. It's important that we walk the walk and just not talk the talk when it comes to right to life. So here's, I think, where we find ourselves. You need the leadership because for far too long, we've had a lot of Republicans that get into office and they're almost like potted plants. They don't want to lead. They don't want to put, they want to follow polls, have their finger in the wind. They do not want to take on fights that are going to lead to the media attacking them or the left attacking them. And so what they end up doing is, yeah, you know, they'll do a tax cut here, something there, but they tend to defer to the media, they defer to corporations. And what that means in this day and age is that the left will win because they're going on all fronts. They're pushing their agenda through the schools. They're pushing their agenda through corporate America. They're pushing their agenda through an unaccountable bureaucracy. If all you say you're gonna do is sit there and only deal with taxes and, and certain spending issues, uh, then you're giving away the game. So you need full spectrum leadership. You need to understand that the threats to freedom are not limited to what happens in an election or even in the halls of government, uh, but it extends far broader than that. We understand that in Florida, and that's why we've become the free state of Florida, because we've protected this freedom all across the board. We need to get busy with this in Washington, D.C. Uh, as president, we will reverse Biden's disastrous economic policies. We're gonna stop spending this country into oblivion. The state of Florida, our, we have millions of more people than New York State does now, and our budget is half the size of New York State. When there's excessive spending, I veto it. Our debt is the second lowest per capita in the country. Don't tell me it can't be done. We're not destined to plunge this country uh, into debt-ridden destitution, and so we need a new way of thinking. We also need to unleash all of our domestic energy here in this country. We have resources. Don't force people into electric cars. Don't force them to use windmills. Let's use what we have. It's better for your pocketbook, but it's also better for our national security. And I will finally be the president to bring the issue of our open southern border to a conclusion. I've heard about this since I've been an adult. For decades, we've complained about the open border. We've complained about everything that's happening. 
Now is the time to act. On day one, we declare a national emergency. We mobilize all assets, including the military. Yes, we build a border wall, but we stop the invasion, and we hold the drug cartels accountable for the carnage that they are causing in this country. We will also usher in a reckoning for the federal government's disastrous COVID-19 policies. Fauciism was wrong. Fauciism was destructive. Fauciism has hurt millions and millions of people, the businesses that were lost, the kids who got locked out of school, the people who were forced to take a jab that they did not want just to put food on their table. And if we don't have accountability for this, if we're not willing to look back and say what went wrong and hold people accountable accordingly, they are going to try to do this in the future. And I can tell you this, when we get in there and bring accountability, we're gonna do it because this can never happen in our country ever again. We must be rooted in truth, and accordingly, that must mean we may fight, I, must fight ideologies that are hostile to truth. And the woke mind virus represents an attack on truth itself. And because woke represents a war on truth, we will wage a war on woke ideology. And some people say, not to worry about woke, that it's not something that we should be concerned of. First of all, having a society that's rooted in truth is important. Don't tell me that a man can get pregnant and expect me to accept that. I will not accept that, and we cannot have a society that accepts that. But even aside from that, don't think that woke doesn't have an impact on your life and will really be able to have a devastating impact if it takes hold even further. When woke takes our economy by things like ESG, the average person becomes poorer as a result of that. When woke overtakes the education system, the average student becomes dumber as a result of that. When woke overtakes our criminal justice system like it has in San Francisco, like it has in Los Angeles, the average person becomes less safe in their communities as a result in it. Don't tell me it doesn't affect people's lives. I was just in San Francisco. I saw, in 20 minutes on the ground, people defecating on the sidewalk. I saw people using fentanyl. I saw people smoking crack right there in the open, right there on the street. It was a civilization in decay. And it was as a result of leftist ideology pursued leftist policies. So this is a battle that we must win. And my pledge is this. We will fight the woke in the schools. We will fight the woke in the corporations. We will fight the woke in the halls of government. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. We are going to leave woke ideology in the dustbin of history where it belongs. And part of the reason we have to do that is because when it affects institutions, it corrodes the integrity of those institutions. And, you know, I'm somebody who, you know, I was a blue collar kid. Uh, my parents were working folks. I worked minimum wage jobs as a kid to get through school and all this. And I actually put myself in a position where I had a lot of lucrative opportunities. But this was after September 11th, uh, and I felt that we don't have a draft, I should do my part, however small, to serve in the military. So I volunteered to serve in the, in the US Navy. We volunteered to serve uh, in Iraq, and we deployed uh, to Fallujah and Ramadi and a lot of those places. Uh, I was attached to uh, SEAL Team One, and I was proud of doing that, proud of the people I served alongside, proud to have worn the cloth of our country. And I think a lot of veterans feel that way, and even though I had a lot of other opportunities, uh, you know, doing that for a cause greater than yourself is a satisfaction money just can't buy. And it pains me to this day to run into veterans now, because this never used to happen, but I run into veterans now who say, 
they would not advise their kids or grandkids to join today's military. They say they see it's gone woke, they see that they're promoting gender ideology and other types of social experimentation. That has caused morale to go down and it has caused recruiting to plummet. And I can promise you this, on day one as, on, as commander in chief, we will rip the woke out of our military. We will get it focused back on the mission and we will make sure that it's something that people are proud of again. We will also go about the business on day one of reconstitutionalizing this out of control federal government. Our founding fathers created a constitution with three branches of government. They did not create a fourth branch of government, an administrative state that does what it wants and is not constitutionally accountable to we the people. And yet that's what has developed. A lot of the most important things in people's daily lives now, what kind of car you can drive, what kind of energy you can use, whether you can have a gas stove, those are decided not by your elected representatives, but by nameless, faceless bureaucrats deep in the bowels of Washington, D.C., who are imposing rules on our country. That is not the way the Constitution is designed. We're going to discipline that bureaucracy, and we're going to return the government to its rightful owners, we, the American people. And you need to do it because when you look at how government has been weaponized, you know, if you're a pro-life activist, you may end up having FBI agents storm your house, even when you said that you would surrender voluntarily. And that power is being applied in ways that they're going after disfavored groups. The government has been weaponized. This is not something that the Founding Fathers would be surprised about. They knew that if you allowed power to accumulate in a, in a capital city like they have in Washington, if you don't hold these agencies constitutionally accountable, human nature being what it is, they will abuse their power. And for far too long, both Republicans and Democrats have looked the other way. They've said, oh, we can't do anything about it. We're not allowed to fire people. I can tell you this, when I get in there, uh, there's gonna be a new sheriff in town. You're gonna have a new FBI director day one. You're gonna see the Justice Department turned inside out. We are not gonna sit idly by and let them mobilize uh, power against people of faith and people with whom they disagree. For far too long, this bureaucracy has imposed its will on us. It's about time we impose our will on it, and that's what we're gonna do. But here's the deal. None of this matters if we don't win. There is no substitute for victory. Uh, we cannot continue with the culture of losing where we lose winnable races. We have 49 Republican senators right now. We should have 55 Republican senators, and we would have been able to stop a lot of Biden's nonsense if we had that. In Florida, we've created a culture of winning. When I became governor, Florida was a one-point state, and I won by 32,000 votes. People told me in a close state, you got to trim your sails, uh, you can't be bold, uh, just don't, don't make waves. I understand why they said that, but I rejected that advice. I earned 100% of the executive power and I set out to use it. And we advanced a bold agenda, we delivered fantastic results, and fast forward four years later, we didn't win by 32,000 votes, we won by over 1.5 million votes, the largest landslide in Florida Republican gubernatorial history. And we weren't just winning Republicans, we won over 60% of Hispanics. We won independence by 18%. Miami-Dade County, 2.8 million people. Hillary Clinton had won it by 30 points in 2016. We won it by double digits in 2022. We have a majority of people out there who believe in our message. They will get with us. We just got to make sure that they understand this election is about two things. Holding Joe Biden accountable for his failures and us offering a better path forward, a positive vision for how we restore America to greatness. And we have to do this. Uh, I think about why I'm motivated to run, and look, I've got kids, you have kids, grandkids. We wanna leave America better for the next generation, 
than we found it. That, that's kind of our birthright that we have to do that. And I'm motivated by that, but I'm also motivated, motivated by this. I know throughout our history, generations of Americans have sacrificed so that we could live in a free society. And I'm reminded of President Reagan saying, freedom is only one generation away from extinction. It's not passed along in the bloodstream. I used to think that was an exaggeration. Having lived through the last four or five years, I'll tell you, freedom is fragile in this country. Do not take freedom for granted. And when freedom comes under attack, it's our responsibility to stand up and fight for it. Our founding fathers understood this. When they met in Philadelphia to create the Constitution, they had studied the history of every republic and the history of mankind because they wanted to draw lessons about what they needed to do. And the one lesson they drew from all those republics throughout history was this. Every one of them had failed. And so they understood it fell to the United States of America to determine once and for all, can people really govern themselves? Can we have a society based on the idea that our rights come from God, not from the government, that we live under a rule of law, not the rule of individual men, or was mankind forever destined to live under various forms of despotism? And they understood that it would fall to this country to, to answer that question once and for all. And when Benjamin Franklin walked out of that convention, he was actually asked, would you give us a monarchy or a republic? He said a republic if you can keep it. Because he understood this is not something that's foreordained. We'll have a free society as long as enough people want to fight for a free society. And so I'm motivated by the people that have fought for that. You look just across the Potomac here. I used to fly into Reagan Airport back in the day, and there was one uh, route you could take that took you flush parallel to the National Mall. So if you looked out the left side of the plane, you saw really close, beautiful views of the Lincoln Memorial, the reflecting pool, uh, the Washington Monument, then up perched on the hill, the beautiful U.S. Capitol building, and you felt a sense of pride because that's symbolic of the ideas and the values that have made this country great. But what I realized after doing that trip a few times, the best monuments were not actually out the left side of the plane. Because if you looked out the right side of the plane, you looked over the Potomac River, you saw small, nondescript monuments arranged in an orderly fashion over rolling hills in a place called Arlington National Cemetery. And it occurred to me, it had occurred to me, it occurred to me you can have the best constitution in the world, you could have the best declaration of independence in the world, you could have the greatest presidents in the world, uh, other great leaders, but ultimately if you don't have people that are willing throughout history to stand up, put on that uniform, risk their lives, and indeed give that last full measure of devotion in service to a greater cause, then none of that's going to amount to very much. And so we not only owe it to our kids and grandkids to stand up and fight, we owe it to those who have fought for us in the past. We must do justice to their legacy. And so our task is very simple. No excuses. Let's get this done. I will tell you this. If I'm the nominee, uh, you guys can book your ticket for January 20th, 2025, the west side of the Capitol, we will be out there with that left hand on the Bible. We'll have the right hand in the air. We'll take the oath as the 47th president, and we will get to work on day one to restore this country to the greatness that it deserves. I thank you all. God bless you, and God bless these United States of America. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good to see you. God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the executive director of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, Timothy Head. Thank you so much, Governor DeSantis, and certainly thank you so much uh, to all of our guests and our speakers this morning. Was that encouraging? Did y'all like that? We're about 40% through this weekend's conference. How about that, huh? So listen, while, uh, while I still have you, I need you to pay attention really quick. There's a couple of things that I want to cover for you, and then we're going to 
Uh, I know that uh, you know, some of y'all might have had to skip breakfast to, to get into the room on time. Uh, we'll let you get some lunch. But listen, uh, tonight I want to make everybody aware, uh, I mentioned yesterday at our town hall that we're going to actually screen the movie Sound of Freedom in this room tonight. Jim Caviezel's new movie that actually debuts in, in theaters in about two weeks. Uh, but we're pleased to have a pre-screening of it tonight right here. Uh, we'll be we, uh, uh, watching it on these screens. 7.30 in here, so uh, when we finish our breakout sessions this afternoon, you can go and get a bite to eat, and then uh, you can head, uh, head back in here, and uh, we will we'll start at 7.30. runs a little over an hour and a half, so we should have you uh, out by 9.30, and you can all get your beauty sleep for tomorrow. Secondly, I want you also be, to be very aware that tomorrow morning, just like this morning, we're starting almost exactly at 9 o'clock. So, uh, so tomorrow is not the day to sleep in, okay? You can sleep in on Sunday, on Monday, when you get back home. Uh, but what we need everybody in their seats bright and early on uh, Saturday morning as well. Again, back in here, we're going to have a full lineup. Uh, we're pleased to say that we're actually going to have four more presidential candidates that are going to be with us tomorrow morning. Who, uh, who is aware that um, former Congressman Will Hurd uh, just announced yesterday that he's running for, for president. And uh, we just were able to finalize an arrangement that he actually, um, on quick notice, is going to jump on a plane and join us tomorrow morning to share more about his own personal story and vision. We'll hear the same from Nikki Haley, uh, from Larry Elder, and also from Perry Johnson. We're excited to have those, plus several other wonderful um, guests and friends uh, like Judge Janine Pirro. Any ju Janine Pirro fan fans here? So tomorrow morning is going to be another full, exciting, and I think encouraging morning.